Uh, thank you for joining us on day six. When we saw your call with its reference to the plague, we were reminded that many scholars in the 14th century went on to write about the decay and decline of higher education during and immediately after that tragedy. Although new institutions and charters did follow 200 years later. With that in mind, we thought that sharing a five week fragment from the taxonomy of educational objectives that we set ourselves in January at Harvard might trigger a good discourse on what design is and what it does. At one level, architecture is a discipline of material organization and many orders. Many notable shifts in its discourse are connected to technology, including material research. And whilst the Corbusier characterized the relationship between the architect and engineer as a struggle, we know for sure and there are many examples of this, that to the contrary, this alliance has often produced precious outcomes. When we trace the history of materials, we should be on the next slide. When we trace of the, the history of next materials like steel and concrete, we can see architects are left out of the loop as numeracy, articulacy, industrialization drive a newness. Labor divides itself and regroups in fresh permutations leaving designers behind all the time. Jennifer, Nelson and I were frustrated by, the, by observing such a trend in the cross-laminated timber world and want to tackle the question that by, want to tackle that question by searching for controlling design ideas and visions. Although through a, through a pedagogical approach that she will unfold. Through sponsorship by Swentir and Trust, we immersed ourselves in Sweden during February, where we visited great architecture ending in the town of Skellefteå, where Martinson's timber factory manufactures CLT and other timbers in sustainable fashions. We spent time looking at technique, traditions, capacity of the material to give the studio a good base to begin. Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, the studio that Hanif and I developed uh, begins with these four uh, conceptual underpinnings. The first questions the emergence of effects in recent architectural history and locates the design project in the American South, while the third and fourth themes challenge the aesthetics of wood and what we are calling CLT blanks. When the Guggenheim Museum opened in Bilbao, Spain in 1997, it produced an instantaneous reaction from around the globe. New packs were formed between cultural institutions, architects and cities all vying for their own version of this newly minted shiny museum. Labeled the Bilbao effect, the recipe was as follows. Iconic architecture plus cultural investment could reinvent dying cities. Similarly, the Dubai effect, largely attributed to the rise of gravity-defying towers, perpetrated during the construction boom of the 2000s, greatly altered Dubai's skyline and became a symbol for free market capitalism. In the late uh, 19th century, after the Great Fire, the city of Chicago's rebuilding effort resulted in the first tall building constructed out of structural steel, one third the weight of its masonry counterpart. Steel towers were fast to erect and exceeded fire code. A new type was born. The Chicago effect shifted paradigms. Currently, we see another pattern emerging with the architectural and structural advancement of mass timber, specifically in the Scandinavian countries. Much like these other effects, this Scandinavian effect has the potential to travel to other contexts. Throughout the semester, the students have designed two projects, tackling the programs of a single family house, which we're gonna focus on tonight, uh, and a mid-rise tower. Here, Mises House and Tower are revelatory. The Farnsworth House came first and the Seagram's Tower came after. Yet in the spirit of a shared structural solution seen here in the column detailing of both buildings, we almost forget that there's such a significant difference in height between the two. We see this transla translation as part of the pedagogical experiment from house to tower. When challenging these two typologies, Timber is both a familiar and unfamiliar material. In type five construction within the US, wood translates seamlessly into a single family house 
from wood framing on the left to cross laminated timber panels on the right. CLT offers an alternative as two by sixes are now laminated together into large panels instead of framed out at 16 inches on center. Benefits uh, are measurable and include overall reduction of construction time, factory precision for geometry, and now we have houses with solid walls. Constructing mid-rise towers out of wood is counterintuitive, yet parallels the revolutionary thinking of steel construction in the Chicago case. The studio has conceptually positioned CLT as a series of large structural sheets or blanks comprised of three, five, and seven ply laminated timber panels, measuring nine foot by 50 foot in lengths with endless possibilities for openings, shape, and geometry. These blanks will be used for elevation and interior walls, as well as floor slabs and, or plates. As elevation and plates are sliced and cut into rooms for a house or multiplied into stacks for a mid-rise tower, CLT blanks become a prime material for testing architectural and structural ideas. Additionally, we've asked the students in the studio to make a representational position around the aesthetics of wood. For decades, Europeans have doubled down on soft white wood interiors for grand halls, quaint bedrooms, and accordion corridors to curve surfaces in double height spaces for schools and pavilions. Or we see a wood as lifestyle from Ikea's 2015 furniture collection, largely played out in a series of stools, benches, and desks to Sam Jacobs' plank scarf for sale at 30 quid. It seems clear to us the image of wood is on trend. Switching to art practice, Donald Judd's materials listed as Douglas for plywood in the gallery follows the proportions of standard plywood sheet material. While Rachel White reads untitled felt floor are resin felt castings of a 120 year old wood floor meaning it looks like wood, but it is not wood. Or how Lebanese artist Shokar offers clues for how wood might stack in her 1966 sculpture. And lastly, how Mavis Pousset's abstraction of wood texture offers up possibilities for assembly techniques. So as contemporary artists uh, grapple with real and fake imagery of wood, architects absorb the image of wood into contemporary interiors. And we've asked the students to define the aesthetic of wood both as a representational device, but also as a tectonic question that hopefully becomes central to the positioning of the Scandinavian effect. Um, thank you all for entertaining the framework of the studio. And now I'm going to hand it over to Ed, who will get the presentations going. And there seems to be some like noise. Can someone, everybody hit their mute button? Or can, the, can Ellis, could you do that? Yeah, I'll do that. All right. Thank you, Hanif and Jennifer, and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm Ed and I'm from Yangon, Burma. On behalf of my peers, I'd like to thank the Architecture Foundation for this opportunity. Today is day one of two of Mass Timber and the Scandinavian Effect. We will present seven projects today and seven tomorrow. The brief called for a three-story house for a family of 10 on a linear suburban site in Raleigh, North Carolina. As Jennifer mentioned, one of the big questions we're attempting to answer as a studio is, is there a Scandinavian effect? And if so, how can it be transplanted to a different cultural context, specifically of the American South? Today's set of seven projects all draw from American Southern vernaculars and American domesticity. America is big and Americans love big things, from Big Macs to big houses. Some projects reinvent an existing housing type, like the McMansion, the boarding house, or the dock trot. Other projects, rather than starting from a housing type, reappropriate or rescale singular elements, shiplap siding, a large roof, gable roofs, or a porch. We'll have time for questions at the end of all the presentations, and with that, I will now kick us off for today. This is a project to bring back the boarding house. Common in 19th and early 20th century America, boarding houses provided rooms to individual renters for anywhere from a few days to several months or years. 
Communal meals were provided each day at a shared dining table, cooked by the boarding house's proprietor. For individuals from large Southern families, the boarding house offered a familiar transitional stage before independence. While hotels were run by men, boarding houses were owned and operated by women, allowing them to monetize their domestic labor. Upstairs, a young boarder returns to her modest room from a long day at work. She checks in on the old man who lives downstairs. They both serve as a surrogate family for the single parent and baby next door. Boarding houses were also key places for writers and artists to be away from family and to live with strangers. Upstairs, an artist paints. Below, a writer works on her novel. If the interiors of the old boarding house are differentiated by wainscoting, wood paneling, and wallpaper, what might introduce difference in the interiors of a contemporary boarding house? Can CLT blanks provide an answer? Although the rhetoric around CLT implies standardization and modularity, CNC routing technology actually allows for mass customization rather than mass standardization. Can each CLT blank then be stained a different color and routed a different pattern for a new kind of interior wallpaper? Similarly, how can a boarding house also project difference on the exterior? CLT's edge grain and material makeup offer clues about how the house could look individuated from the outside as well. Given that CLT itself is made up of individual cross-laminated planks, might the house too be cross-laminated? The site has a clear front and back, a front east towards the state park and a back west towards the suburban surroundings. Instead of deploying a regular plan grid, the grid is rotated and skewed, allowing the cross-lamination to be expressed on both facades, resulting in a flat front elevation and a back volumetric elevation that are the same. Like CLT planks, each mass is conceptualized as its own volume with gaps in plan to accommodate the stairs, bathrooms, closets, and kitchen. Doubling up the wall and floor panels also mitigates acoustic issues, one of the big challenges with CLT construction. Tectonically, the vertical spines cross laminate to carry the loads of the horizontal floors and ceilings which are capped by the exterior wall and roof panels. And what of the Scandinavian effect? Stockholm streets are lined with row houses that are self-similar but differentiated by color, shades of pinks, purples, and yellows. Each mass of the boarding house is further differentiated by slight shades of beiges and skin tones on the exterior. The nuanced shades on the exterior play contrast to the less nuanced colors on the interiors. The owner lives on the ground floor close to the dining room and kitchen. Two floors up, the artist's CLT panels fold out, becoming an easel or storage for large paintings. The grandparents' room is completely lined with a waist-height CLT panel that is mailed to function as a guardrail. They all eat dinner together at a communal dining table. The American boarding house is back. That's it for me. From the Southern boarding house, we now go to the Southern porch house with my colleague, Anna Goga. Hi, my name is Anna Goga. I'm an architect from Moscow, Russia, and my project's name is Porch House. The project was developed through the observations on two main topics, American domesticity and fake CLT behavior. Part of the project was the idea to rethink traditional CLT behavior as a flat blank material and possibly make wood look like something else. Similarly to the approach of the artist Harry Roseman, who is making wood look like almost plastic or paper by simply folding plywood sheets. The same operation was made to CLT blank by experimenting with the possibility to fold it, 
in order to question its structural and aesthetic possibilities. The other topic I was looking at was American domesticity. Historically, American home was always associated with an image of a porch being an essential part of American house. In a way, porch symbolized the potential of living differently with a sense of novelty and adventure. Visually, porch was a transitional space between a completely private part of a house and its surroundings. Basically, porch framed the existing landscape. In suburbia, porch was also considered as an element for informal neighbor connections across landscapes because of its openness. Historically, porch was also an essential element of American bigness domesticity, which was represented and in a way even exaggerated in artworks. American bigness domesticity reflected the idea of a house being a place for what inhabitants can expect in the future rather than what they need right now. For this reason, rooms were designed twice bigger than it's required for a current function to potentially serve extra ones in this space. Ultimately, porch became an essential part of American bigness domesticity by being an empty space ready for any potential use. Sometimes it served an extension of the house, hosting the extra space for existing functions or providing even new ones. Here you can see an example of a sleeping porch when bedrooms basically moved outside of the house. With my project, I tried to rethink the, the classic southern wraparound porch topology, where porch goes around the whole house. The main challenge of the project was to redesign this topology using CLT blanks to bring new aesthetics to it and reveal the porch as a fundamental element of the house. Following the same logic of the wraparound plan, where the inner part of the house is completely private and in a way hidden, porch becomes the main part of the house with all the private functions such as bedrooms and bathrooms being located in the center. The porch itself is a shared space serving all the functions needed for the house. It's basically a one singular space with the possibility for functions to grow or move all over the porch. Using a technique of fold, I wrapped tilted blanks folds around the central part to form a porch. Folds become the main structural elements supporting itself and making a rigid structure altogether. I also preserved an original aesthetics of a chunky rope around house and in a way rethought it with the new materiality of a CLT fold. The porch becomes the main part of the house, which is constantly active with many things happening there at the same time. Conceptually, CLT folds become a formal gesture and a means to represent a continuity of space. Their movement, porch house unfolds its constantly changing scenarios in space and time. Overall, the folds itself become habitable spaces, allowing for any function to happen there. CLT fold blurs the boundaries between inside and outside, between house and surroundings, between function and spaces. Thank you. That you're muted. Who's next? Sir? Hi. Um, I'd like to remind attendees to refrain from drawing or annotating the screen. Um, we've noticed someone made a few marks on the screen, so if they could please clear that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, now, if Anna's project has a big porch, the next project has big hair. Stay tuned to find out what that means with Daniel Garcia. My name is Daniel Garcia. I'm an architect from the US, and my project for the Mass Timber Studio is called Post, Post, and Beam, a dog trot for Raleigh. And this diagram helps to position my project relative to the studio brief. And it'll help guide the presentation starting with CLT blinks, then the American South on effect, and finally the aesthetics of wood. The house is situated on the outskirts of Raleigh and is made of cross laminated timber, a material which I consider to be a technological marvel. With CLT, logs are sorted, scanned, and sawn into boards using highly digitized processes. Individual boards are then robotically laminated, routed, and labeled per the architect's specifications and then sent to job sites where the custom cut panels are assembled in a fraction of the time and with a fraction of the crew needed for conventional construction. This project seeks to position CLT as a distinctly post-digital material 
by playfully rearranging our ingrained formal and material associations of a domestic house typology in the American South. The dog trot, also known as a breezeway house, dog run, or possum trot, is a style of house that was common throughout the southeastern United States during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The main architectural feature was a large breezeway through the center of the house to cool its occupants in the hot southern climate. Another quintessentially southern condition is big hair. Pictured here are just a few of Dolly Parton's big hairstyles juxtaposed to some of their analogs in the dog trot type. So I'm proposing to transpose the famous southern dictum of the bigger the hair, the closer to God into the realm of architecture by completing the sentence with a Miesian twist. So this last image of Dolly before she rose to fame most closely resembles my proposal for a house for five couples in Raleigh, which is shown on the right. And the cladding for the house approximates a uniquely Scandinavian material that has long been used to preserve wood shingle siding. Shown here is a triple nave stave church in Norway that is clad in pine tar shingles and Gunnar Asplund's Woodland Cemetery in Stockholm with a pine tar shingle roof. So instead of directly translating this material to the American context, the house will be clad in a readily accessible asphalt shingle with an embossed image of wood. The project also seeks to instrumentalize the digital manufacturing process, which often ends up being covered up by finished materials. Instead, the digital fabrication tools in the factory are used to route ornament and utility patterns into the CLT interiors to avoid common tendencies of applying material finish over rough framing. So while maintaining the general massing of a dog trot, the gable is split in two, offset and slightly rotated in order to emphasize the individual masses and take advantage of CLT's ability to span long distances. These elevations show the breezeway, the standing seam metal roof, and the asphalt shingle siding. The first floor plan shows the breezeway at center, the entry towards the south, and the communal bathing area to the north, which is a nod to Scandinavian bathing culture. So pushing back a bit on traditional notions of domesticity, the house is a house for five couples. So there are three bedrooms and two bathrooms located on the second floor. And the third floor plan has two more bedrooms, another bathroom, a shared kitchen, and a dining area. And finally, the mezzanine level has a living area and a communal working area. Here's a long and short section of the dog trot and an exterior view of the breezeway and patio at the base. Here is a detail of the asphalt shingle siding and the exposed CLT stair hinting at its mode of construction. The interior walls are routed with patterns in the factory before and after paint is added to express utility runs or to marry the ornament and manufacturing process. This view of the mezzanine shows what would normally be framed out as attic space, now completely free of structure due to CLT spanning capacity. And so finally, beyond a play on Southern culture and vernacular, the project really aims to express CLT structural capabilities and encourage new ways of combining utility with ornament in order to better reflect the process of its own creation. Slide you in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Nothing screams American bigness quite like the American McMansion. Please welcome Benson Chen. Hello, I'm Benson Chen from California, and this is a cross laminated McMansion. So I'm situated on one of the sites with a milder terrain and an existing classic American suburban home. The house weaves a series of concepts from CLT layering, cutouts, McMansions, enfilades, the shotgun to the nuclear family. And my nuclear family is comprised of 10 people, two parents, and eight children. So balloon framing has always been the standard suburban house construction type in America. A series of two by four sticks rigidly lined up to create walls and framing. But what differences can CLT as a standardized nine foot, 50 foot blank create? And one of the key differences the house wants to focus on is openings. 
The balloon frame is constrained to frames, while the CLT can be freely cut and milled up to 40% of the surface area. And while CLT comes in three ply, five ply, seven ply, and so on, the project's interest lies in layering up a series of three ply blanks to overlap and compose shapes while adding structural integrity. Imagining the project as a series of these layered walls, I was drawn to the American shotgun house typology, a house where the program is essentially laid out one after another, from living room to bedroom to kitchen and so on. And a characteristic of these types of houses are the onflaught of rooms cascading away without doors as you walk in between rooms seamlessly. The overlapping of the canted square and the circle would then create a layered enfilade, and the house would become defined by a series of these marching lines. Transcribing these shapes into each direction, the enfilade would register very atmospheres depending on the direction of approach. The walls would then be set out to the distance of a standard CLT blank. This image shows a series of interconnected and overlapping living programs at the ground level. Rooms should constantly flow and slide into each other from kitchen to playroom to dining and to library. And the collection to bring the facade and form to the marching walls of the context, we looked into a collection of surrounding Raleigh suburban homes interested in their complex characteristics of accents, shapes, and openings. The collection of slightly varied mass-produced suburban home massings would highlight the push and pull of suburban facade. And by pushing and pulling a program, we could do the same to the house. The project becomes a merge of the layered walls and the push and pull of the suburban kitsch. The plan shows a series of interconnected living spaces with the projected CLT cutouts shown with the dotted lines. The image of the living space looks at the grain of the CLT, where the windows become chamfered to reveal, reveal the layerings, varying in width depending on the angle of the chamfer. The upper level is a unique series of differently sized interconnected rooms. Beds are tucked to the west and communal desks and spaces towards the envelope. So on the upper level, on the left are the bedrooms, on the right is a balcony overlooking the first floor. This atrium allows you to call your kids to dinner from anywhere in the house. The house is built on a concrete foundation erected with pre-milled CLT blanks glazing and painted red as an homage to the classic Scandinavian homes we observed on our trip to Sweden. The front face of the suburban home creates an almost cartoon rendition of a classic suburban home with its red roof, blue window frames, and white brick facade. The back face of the house is then fully glazed, alluding to the oversized balloon frame construction made of CLT, sort of a modern back to the house. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. The next few projects deal with bigness at the scale of a singular element. With an extra large roof, please welcome Anna Kirtner. Hello, my name is Anna Kirtner and I'm from Germany and my project is titled Extra Large Roof, Big Little House, a CLT House for North Carolina. The project is cited on plot number four as part of this strip of new CLT houses. There exists within the catalog of the Southern Suburban House a type which includes an in-law suite addition. This is a dated term to describe the increasingly popular concept of the accessory dwelling unit, or ADU. In other words, a small house attached to a larger house. As multiple generations begin to fill suburban homes, or the suburban house becomes too large for a single family, the ADU fills a gap in available types. The stock of generic ADUs produce their own family of strategies which hint at and contend with formal cohesion. These include the turning twins or the rotated double where the original is scaled and turned, the little sister or scale double where the original is scaled and attached, the tag along or house with the tail where the ADU dangles in addition to the original, two houses joined where two completely individual houses are joined side by side, one house telescoping where the ADU is pulled out of the larger house, or lastly, to the separated twins, one house divided, where the house seems to have once been whole but has since been cut and moved apart. Ultimately, each of these types always produces a half-hearted marriage between the two houses, 
where the hierarchy of the original or big house remains. This house, conceived from the beginning with the ADU in mind, allows the gable to belong to neither the big or little house. Instead, it produces its own orientation and merely gets clipped by the boundary of the two houses. The roof, the big house, and the little house produce their own grains, which are reconciled by the CLT structure and tectonics of the house. Stacking and notching are the standard methods of connection and construction for CLT, and they are pushed forward to produce a new material and formal expression for the suburban house. Because CLT defines anew the economy of manufacturing, whereby irregular geometry and curves do not produce labor or materially intensive processes, new expressions for connection and structure are sought out. The main structure of the house is produced by a perpendicular grain of structural walls, normal to each of the houses. These large CLT blanks are assembled in succession. The intersection of the grains produces rigidity and space for movement through the houses. Though the space of the two houses is never accessible to either side, the staircase produces a shared skylight through which views are possible. This can be seen in greater detail in the plans of the first and second floor as shown here. It is instead a curved wall that binds the two houses together in elevation, producing the only shared space, the porch. The curved CLT panel is milled from one side and notched together. This produces two sides, one smooth, one serrated, and reveals a new CLT grain when aggregated. Lastly, it is the roof which brings the two houses together formally, as can be seen here in this model photograph. Whereas typically a gable might be thought of as two planes, here the roof is reimagined as a set of beams or logs, which become self-supporting. They are milled from both sides and stacked on each other in succession to form the geometry of the roof. The irregular perimeter of the roof in relation to the gable produces stretched and compressed profiles when cut. Together, the tectonics of the CLT blank, the curved wall, and the log roof produce a new effect for the suburban house, a gable which accommodates multiple houses and a tectonic expression which brings to the exterior of the house new translations of type. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. From two houses with one roof, we now go to a project titled Four Pitch, One Roof. Take it away, Kyat. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyat Chin. I'm from Yangon, Myanmar. Uh, my project is titled Four Pitch, One Roof. Given our site is in Durham, North Carolina, this project begins with the exploration of the aesthetic of American South. As a person born to the region, I rely on the lens of the 21st century American South photographers, William Christianberry and Beverly Buchanan, whom have extensively documented American South lifestyle and architecture. While Christianberry captures the neglected houses on the side of the road, Buchanan documents the aging structure of the slave sheds. In addition to photographing, both artists recreate the structures in a smaller scale and stage them on a podium, treating them as monuments. The way both artists frames and stages the structures exposes a new way of seeing the primitive tradition of American South. It reveals the complex nature of the banal. It sheds light on the beauty of careless and naive construction methods. In order to discover my own understanding through the work of Christian Berry and Buchanan, I retraced the work with the attitude of naivety using different mediums, ink and color pencil, to unlock a new way of interpreting the American South vernacular house typology. In conjunction with the aesthetic of vernacular, the effect of CLT will also challenge the traditional reading of American South. As you can see in this series of provocation, these images start to merge the vernacular forms of American South with CLT, questioning the understanding of the primitive structures. The footprint of the house utilizes the maximum buildable area of the site, synonymous to many large American mansions. The massing begins with the simple four pitch roofs manipulated to prioritize the east-west directionality of the context. The house is then placed on the concrete walls to minimize the excavation. Image on the left shows the view as you approach or drive past the house. While there's a clear profile of the pitch roofs, the pediment seems to descend toward the ground, providing shade to the porch. On the right, the pediment becomes a cantilever to cover the public walkway that overlooked the east direction. 
the exterior is cladded with the tree logs that will otherwise be displaced due to the footprint of the house. The parking the bark texture will camouflage the house within the context. The detail on the left shows the typical wall assembly. The natural texture of the CLT is expressed on the interior with insulation built up to our exterior to achieve the proper R value. The detail on the right represents the simple window attachment borrowed from the American South vernacular. The project houses 10 people under four pitch roofs while the house may be conceived as four individual houses from the exterior, the interior contradicts that perception. The dichotomy between exterior and interior is achieved by misaligning the interior walls from the exterior pitch roofs. As you can see from the section, the concrete foundation walls that meet the CLT floor act independently from the datum of the pitch roofs. The free floating roof is possible due to the diagrid system. The diagrid roof is assembled with eight by CLT three ply for lateral support and five ply for diagram pattern to be CNC in the factory. This animation shows how the standard CLT Chad, I think you're muted. Resulting in a subtle tapering effect. First floor is strictly planned and introverted to provide private programs with small gathering spaces that staircases are placed on the north and south side of the house connected by the corridor. The image on the right is the parallel projection of the house view from the west side. The yellow door indicates the entry to the house. The yellow frame thresholds on the left is a public shaded path to the east. The second floor plan shows the circulation programs on the east and west, freeing up the space in between to create a large and disrupted living room. The space is also free from structural wall due to the roof assembly. The parallel projection of the south elevation on the right shows the exposure of diagrid structure from the skylight apertures. Four pitch one roof combines the vernacular house typology of American South with the innovative and sustainable CLT reinterpreting the meaning of constructing a home. Thank you. Thank you, Kyat. Last but certainly not least, the final project for the day also overscales one element, shiplap siding. Please welcome Elif Erez. Hello everyone, I'm Elif from Istanbul, Turkey, and the title of this project is Barn for Barn. This is an overview of where my interests lie at the intersection of the Scandinavian effect, the American South, aesthetics of wood, and CLT blanks. My journey into this semester began with something that didn't quite have to do with Scandinavia when I came across the quote, the village it takes to raise a child is more of a ghost town today, which is perhaps more pertinent now. And since our brief is a three story, 10 person house, I wondered, can a house be the village it takes to raise a child? This led me to an interesting answer provided by a housing model that emerged in Sweden in 1935 called Barnvikehus or the child rich house a government-funded housing initiative made specifically for families with three or more children who are often economically disadvantaged. The system not only provided affordable housing, but created the conditions that could allow for a collective form of childcare where parents can form kindergarten cooperatives or informally care for one another's families. If the footprint of the Barnikahus is about three times smaller than that of the CLT house, some of the extra space can be intentionally dedicated to collective childcare. And in terms of an exploration of wood aesthetics and the CLT blank, I'm interested in all its inherent contradictions. CLT is a big sheet made of many small sticks. It's massive and yet one of the lighter building materials. It can be finger jointed to form these incredibly long pieces. So it's one thing and another at the same time. And this animation is a collection of objects that play on a sense of ambivalence. What I'm trying to, what I'm drawn to about these items, like the Cheerio and the donut, the camping tent and the termite tent covering an entire house, is that taken out of context, they have this ability to flicker between something small and something enormous. And wood as a material also goes between being a monolithic chunk to being ground down to really small bits like OSB and then getting formed back into a hole. So I'm really interested in how this back and forth between parts and holes, large and small, plays out as a representational and formal agenda. The house is an A-frame volume that rests on three blocks that lift it up from the ground. 
The A-frame is clad in shiplap siding panels that are blown up to the scale of a CLT blank. The shiplap performs structurally, picking up some of the cantilever loads. And this animation shows how the relative cantilever loads change as the three entry blocks move. The specific angle of the shiplap can change in response to these loads. The three ground floor blocks provide separate entrances to the three families that live inside. They're also made of CLT that is stacked horizontally, like masonry. This is a breakdown of the elevations. And this is a breakdown of the shiplap CLT panels that compose the facade. In section, the three units are divided by two sets of party walls. The bathroom, storage, and kitchens are housed in the party walls and provide sound insulation and vertically stacked wet spaces. The division between the units moves across the party walls. The unit sizes and number of inhabitants also varies. And this is the plan. On the interior, the CLT is left bare and is perhaps legible as a large-scale shiplap panel. The A-frame occupied on the inside creates the feeling that the house is smaller than it is, like a treehouse. On the exterior, the shiplap is clad in color-treated cork, which adds a layer of ambiguity to the scale of what this is. The whole ground floor and garden area is a big collective playground. The spaces under the A-frame volume in between the entry blocks are semi-enclosed and open to any kind of temporary or flexible use. So while Sweden's Barnikahus model is a relic of the past, it suggests the idea that architecture can incorporate and prioritize care labor and intentionally prov provide a collective infrastructure for it. That's my interpretation of the Scandinavian effect rendered here in some CLT panels that are pretending to be big and small at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's fantastic. Um, perhaps I could turn first to Hanif um, and uh, Jennifer and ask, uh, but we're halfway through uh, your year. Could you, could you explain what the students are going to be doing kind of over the, 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 the next half of the year, please? I'll, shall I go first? So as Jennifer explained, we're looking at the mid-rise tower because the other challenge is that there is a a plethora of towers being invented in this material. So the students are already working on a, a tower, which is now all online because we shifted, the whole school shifted online. So we have a, a, a review coming up in the same city, Raleigh, of the towers on the 4th of May. Jennifer, do you want to add to that? Yeah, there, we're hoping that uh, the students take something that's rooted in the house, whether that's a tectonic question, uh, a structural question or simply an attitude about how to use CLT blanks into the uh, new type of a tower. So we're, we're kind of translating uh, these early concepts that we just showed today uh, into, into the tower form. And could, for those of us not in the US, could you tell us a little about, does, does, is there a CLT industry at all or you know, how, how, how viable are these projects given the, the current sure. nature of the American co construction industry? Sure. Um, as you know, in the UK and in Europe, you guys have been using CLT manufacturing for about 20 years now. We're a little bit more behind in the US. Um, and so it's just now really getting going. Of course, there's a lot of manufacturers that are in place. Um, there are houses, there are uh, mid-rise, uh, commercial buildings being constructed, um, and I would point to a couple. One would be in Portland, Oregon, which is called Carbon 12, and it's uh, the tallest CLT mass timber structure currently in the U.S. The first CLT house was constructed in Seattle by an architect named Susan Jones, um, and then I did a house recently in Atlanta with Hanif, um, which is a single-family house. So uh, it's just gaining momentum. Um, um, fantastic. Guys, we have um, 392 people in your, uh, uh, your review of work, which is slightly daunting prospect, I think, for, um, you know, for, my, for my student days, I would find that a bit alarming. But, but uh, congratulations. Uh, we have a few questions coming through already. Um, I hope some more of those 392 people might pitch in. Um, I'm going to hand over, uh, is if I can find Courtney Richardson, 
Um, let me see if I can unmute you, Courtney. Um, right, Courtney, you should have the mic now if you want to pitch in. Um, sure. Um, just a question that I've had since seeing the presentation from the fall. Um, and I guess this is a question for Jennifer, since um, I think this is probably more oriented towards you, but um, how would you characterize the way in which Southerness is used in the studio? Because I've been kind of struggling with the um, pluralistic, borderline kind of obtuse use of the American South to justify some of the agendas. Um, and so for me, there appears to be a, sometimes a lack of sincerity and questioning of what is a contemporary notion of Southerness. Um, and sometimes it seems like it relies on um, stereotyping in a way. So I was kind of curious if you could um, maybe expand on how you would like to characterize um, the use of Southerness. Sure, that's a good question that should be answered. Um, I think uh, when Hanif and I were thinking about how to set up the studio, um, we needed there to be, a, the project needed to be sited somewhere outside of Scandinavia, right? Because if we're saying the effect might be starting from, um, you know, the, how they're doing things there and we went there and looked at it as a studio, it's important for us to do the project in another context. Um, and so that kind of plays out what I explained about the Chicago effect and the Dubai effect. Um, and so uh, Hanif was really interested in maybe a tier two kind of city, not like uh, the larger cities like New York, um, Boston, Chicago, LA. Um, and so we started to look at the South and specifically Raleigh, Durham. I mean, your question is really about um, the stereotyping being used, like maybe Daniel's big hair or the McMansion. Um, I think in a way, site might be a little bit of a throwaway here. Um, it's, you know, the four conceptual underpinnings that I showed at the very beginning was able, is offering the students uh, multiple kind of places they can attach into with their concepts, right? So um, you'll, tomorrow's session, there'll be much less um, kind of uh, conversation about the American South because the students were simply more interested in the other uh, three categories that were presented. I mean, I'm, Courtney, I think you're from the South. I'm from uh, Alabama originally, and I just built my first project in Atlanta. Um, I do think that uh, it's a different place. It's a different context. Um, and in my opinion, uh, you know, I always try to use those kind of things in my own design work. Brilliant. Um, Nathaniel, um, I'm going to unmute you. Are you there? Nathaniel Steinbrook? Yes, I am. I, I was just wondering if, um, just since talking about materials, if you would consider uh, bamboo. Um. Shall I, shall I answer this, Ellis? Please, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I think, I think wood is attractive and it, it almost has a Pavlovian effect on everyone of warmth and back to your childhood and back to our, our origins. And, and then if you try to do a studio and it's such a short time, unless you're specific to one type of wood, which is what we've tried to pick here, you run into a big problem because it is probably the most favorite material of everyone. And bamboo itself, as you probably know from your, your own question in the, in the Far East, has been around a long time. And there are people experimenting with how you make other materials out of bamboo as a proper building product. So it, it's not some, we didn't allow the students too much space to go and experiment with different species. If you did a bamboo response, you would do a bamboo studio. That was the, the dilemma. So we wanted to narrow it down. Because as I said in, in my introduction, we were kind of frustrated that the industry and uh, you know, the, the way procurement and um, fashion drives this kind of new invention of CLT was what our frustration was. And we were trying to look for pinning that down to find design ideas, some visions that we can control and not leave it up to the industry to say how it really is. So bamboo, maybe another studio in the future, Nathaniel. Um, and um, it's not really a question, but Emily Baker's got a few observations about um, CLT in Arkansas. So Emily, if, if you're there, um, you're around. Emily? Have I lost you? 
Yeah, Emily, can you talk about Walmart yeah, yeah. down in Arkansas? Oh, sure. Yeah, so I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Oh, look, 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 look. We're hello. Oh. <laughs> and uh you know we're kind of close to the kind of seat of of uh walmart massive corporation and they have certainly uh, been a, a big part along with uh, uh peter mckeith and people in our school of architecture the timber industry in the state and regionally in kind of tipping off uh, the wood industry that's already here into some of these more advanced kind of uh, uses of the material. And we've got a 700 person dorm here on campus, a large library facility here on campus that are both made out of CLT. So, and there's gonna uh, major projects in the works coming up, new building for our architecture school, as well as the new um, Walmart headquarters planned. For this material so it's it's certainly going to be have an effect i think on our building industry terrific that's exciting news um guys i think we have had a uh, all the questions that have come up answered but um i think we probably hit a world record for the most attendees at a, a student crit ever uh we hit it i think we hit the 400 mark at one point and um, I thought the quality of the work's fantastically high. Um, so tomorrow we have another, the other seven students from the, the group